I should When I speak today, we want to talk about the defection of Hugh Jackson. Last year, Andy Dalton had a breathtaking transformation. He was even in the MVP conversation uh, before he got injured. Now, Dalton loses his offensive coordinator for the second time in three years. And the question everyone has around Hude Nation is, will the offense take a step back? Well, we know this team has built a very solid roster over the past few years now. Yes, there are certain players, more so on the bottom of the roster, that have somehow maintained their roster spot for less than obvious reasons, but in reality, the Bengals have a very solid core, specifically on the offense. Obviously, they've been drafting very well recently, and they've been able to retain the majority of their talent, with a few more on the way as well. A group that has really been positively recognized around the league in recent years. Having this luxury means there's a certain chemistry on the team, and for the most part, a way of doing things right for once. Meaning it really wasn't going to matter too much who took over as new offensive coordinator this year. Jackson showed us last year what this offense was really capable of, and now with Ken Zampezi at the helm, I don't imagine much is going to change in terms of production. This is the same overall group, that core I previously mentioned, and Zampezi has stated the offense will be run very similar to last year. It's up to the players and the new additions to continue to build off last year's growth. Look, I agree. Zampese is great. But but the question's going to be, does he have Hugh's confidence? Does he have his creativity? And, and you know, the offense might have to be even more creative this year with, with two of our top three receivers gone and castaways and rookies trying to, uh, to fill their place. For sure. Marvin and Moe developed well with Andy in their four years together, but neither one is a centerpiece for an offense, just like they weren't when they were here. That's not to say they weren't valuable, but they are replaceable. Now we have Brandon LaFell and Tyler Boyd as the compliments to AJ Neifert. LaFell may not be the vertical threat that Jones was, but he's just as much of a red zone target. And Boyd already comes in as a very similar player to Sanu, so I don't see much of a drop off there. Being on the field with the safeties worried about AJ over the top and Eifert over the middle will naturally make these guys look better. Not to mention if Jeremy Hill bounces back from the sophomore slump as well. His improvement can really open up the offense for our new weapons. In fact, this offense may live and die by how Jeremy's third year goes. Right, right. And and that's going to really impact what we do with Gio next year, too. You, you know, John, my grandmother used to tell me that if you believe in yourself, you and your friends can jump off a bridge and fly. And in terms of confidence, I have to say, I think Dalton's going to be even more confident this year. After four years in the league, Dalton finally, he, he became a little more vocal. He started to take command of the team. And the reason he got this way, and I've been saying this for years, John, the reason he got this way is that he finally had what I call a Dalton Whisperer. Look, I've pointed out before that dolphins can do everything. They can do math, physics, and even football. And we all know that to be the best of the best in the aquatic world, you need a guy who can get in your ear and, and push you every step of the way. You've heard, I'm assuming you've heard of Joe Noonan, right? The Dolphin Whisperer, John, you've heard of uh, him. I really prefer if we stay on topic here. Right, so so Joe was actually named a merman by Native American elders, a sign that they recognized him as the return of the mer people, or, or those who are the bridge between the tribes of the land and the tribes of the sea. Now, now that, John, is a goal to be achieved. So are you saying Dalton will take a step back without Jackson, the Dalton Whisperer? Well, the reality is Zampese might be the real Dalton Whisperer. Hugh was all about show, talking the talk, taking credit for Dalton's success, but Zampese was the QB coach. Now that Jackson has left, Dalton seems even more confident. He's been talking about getting better and, and how he's excited to work with his new receivers. The man simply hasn't batted an eye. Whether it's Zampese or maybe his other teacher, Tom House, the mechanics guru, that's the true cause of his improvement. He would definitely seem to force Dalton out of his shell and become the true leader of the team. Something that really had to happen eventually if this team does want to maybe win a playoff game here or two. Oh, it looks like we have a video caller. Hello, you're on Sorry If I Spit When I Speak. Yeah, this is Ace Boogie calling in, and I just want to say, Haji, you need to put some respect on the Bengals' name. I ain't going to say it no more. And honestly, I don't even know if you even like the Bengals. Like, your draft grades were a joke, bro. I don't know if you were sitting and having lunch with James Walker when you wrote those, but you make Joe Reedy look like an optimist. Bro. Wait a minute. Are you the guy who's been harassing me on Twitter? Yeah, yeah, it's me. It's me, the guy from Twitter, yeah. Ace Boogie. A-M-B-A-5-1-3. 
Look, somebody needs to put you in check because John is being too nice about it. And I mean, I don't even know how you come up with these draft results. I don't know if you let your dolphin friends make decisions for you or what you do. Uh, but clearly, um, you need some help in that area, sir, as far as grading the draft. For your information, my picks were based on extremely nuanced analytics. I had a very nerdy young man look at all sorts of stats and graphs and profootballreference.com and the Panama Papers, yada, yada, yada. Okay, pro football reference. Okay, cool. So you just glossed over the fact where Tyler Boyd's career stats at Pitt were some of the most consistent production that anybody in this NFL draft receiver class has. Yeah, look, I'm not so high on Boyd because I'm not sure he can get separation against NFL corners. You look at him at, at uh, Pitt, and I mean, he puts up Larry Fitzgerald numbers. That doesn't mean that he's going to be Larry Fitzgerald. That just means that he was very productive. I mean, from freshman year to his senior year, this guy played in the slot. He played in the backfield. He played on the outside. I mean, what else do you need? I, I just don't get it. And you guys want to talk about his speed and his separation? Well, last time I checked, speed isn't the only reason why you cause separation between corners. Uh, if I last remembered, I think route running has something to do with that. If I go this way and you go that way, no matter how fast I am, my route running skills is going to cause separation. And if we're talking about separation, what separation did Muhammad Sanu have? And was his 40 time as fast or was it the same? Oh, okay. So that doesn't even matter. He's one of the most polished guys in this class. And yeah, we could have had Corey Coleman, but Corey Coleman only knows how to run four routes because he came out of a spread offense. Boy, can him out of a pro style. So Corey Coleman will be good, but he can't just jump in day one and have an impact. You actually have to learn how to run and run the plays in the offense first, which Boy can do from day one. So what are we worried about? What are your thoughts on Hugh leaving? Well, I'm not really too worried, John, about Hugh leaving. The offense will be the same under Zampezi with very minor tweaks, just like Hugh when he came in. Uh, so I feel like it was a great move. We hired somebody in-house, and Zampezi already has a great relationship with Dalton, and that began way before he was even in the picture. So I think that will be okay. Y yeah, but we lost a lot of weapons. Okay, you keep saying that we... Uh, lost so many weapons, but you ignore the fact that we've also done a great job of reloading. We brought in LaFell, we brought in Boyd. I mean, arguably those guys could potentially be better than Mo and Marvin. So, as long as we're not losing a guy like AJ Green, Tyler Eifert, Jeremy Hill, Gio Barney Bernard, then I don't think we are going to have an issue. I mean, when you look at the 2014 playoff game, who was missing? Who were the biggest pieces missing? You know, we had... AJ Green and Tyler Arkford gone. I mean, Gresham was garbage, but he didn't play anyway. But AJ Green was gone, and the offense died. So as long as we still have AJ Green, who's one of the best receivers in football, I don't know what number Muhammad Sanu did. Muhammad Sanu even play last year? I mean, and I don't know what what number Marvin Jones comes at, but it's sure not anywhere close to AJ Green, and sure not anywhere close to Tyler Eifert. Where are they at in the top hundred players this year? I'm I'm still looking. Oh oh, they're not in there. Okay. So, even with that offense, Bruce Cosley couldn't have saved that offense that played in the playoffs uh, a couple years ago. So, I think we'll be just fine and we'll be stacked on offense like we always are. And we'll be just like we were after Jay Gruden left. I mean, he's an extremely, he was an extremely gifted coach, don't get me wrong. But as long as Bob Brockowski isn't coming back through those doors, I'm good with it. I don't think there's anything to worry about. So, just stop pouting, Haji. This is your boy, Ace Boogie, signing out. All right. Well, well, thanks for the call. You know, I don't even think Hugh was a great coach, to be honest. Where was that crafty game planning of his in the playoff game? We were shut out. Yes, shut out in the first three quarters against the pathetic Steelers defense. Jeremy Hill and the rushing game were outplayed by the, what, third, fourth string running backs on the Steelers. And then look how we scored our touchdowns in that crazy fourth quarter. A 42-yard pass by A.J. McCarron that resulted in pass interference and placing the ball on the four-yard line. And then a big-time throw by McCarron to A.J. Green with under two minutes to go. Well, looking at it from Hugh's side, there's really only so much craftiness and out-of-the-box game plan you can do with an inexperienced backup quarterback. Don't get me wrong, we were still the better team on that field, but the difference in quarterback talent was far too great for us to overcome our shortcomings on offense. Not to mention some questionable calls made by the refs, but that's a sensitive topic for another time. 
Plus, Dahl and the Stab was such a command at the line of scrimmage in the pre-snap phase that McCarron simply couldn't replicate due to his inexperience. The audibles, the on-the-go play and calling, and the adjustments Dahl did so well in the regular season simply weren't there for us when it mattered the most. And you're right. Jeremy Hill had, what, 12 yards on 11 carries outside of his 38-yard run? He didn't really do a lot once Gio went down with a concussion. Okay, fine, but but look, I'm not even sure Hugh's head was totally in the game. I'm not sure he, he was ever really committed to the team. He was always thinking about his next job. And, and who can blame him? He was a head coach for Oakland. He had a big leather chair and everything. So he always had those high expectations for himself. But Zampese, he's only been a positions coach. This guy's excited about the opportunity, and the man bleeds orange and black. Agreed. And Pease has been here for some time now, but now he finally gets his chance to actually lead the offense instead of just being the quarterback's coach. Honestly, I would have preferred someone from outside the organization when they're stuck in first-round purgatory to try to spark some change. But with how much the offense bloomed last year, I gotta figure it's best to try to maintain some consistency. And it'll be different from Hugh, just because of how much of a character he was. But I imagine Zampezi will come in with the same level of motivation. He should know what he's dealing with. Yeah, exactly. Plus, he seems more subdued, wise, kind of like my old friend and Buddhist guru, Richard Gere. Uh, Hugh is a little impatient. He lacks vision. Look, after the season, Marvin Lewis, who is the nicest and classiest man in sports. Anybody's going to tell you that, man. Anybody's going to tell you that. Marvin Lewis tells Hugh that he wants him to be his successor after next year. Can't get better than that. They both go to Mike Brown, sharing that Brown, but, but Mike... Uh, Brown refuses to put it down in writing, probably because Mike Brown is so cheap that he didn't want to use his expensive stationery. But Hugh didn't see that he had a golden ticket like Charlie and Willy Wonka. So what does he do? He goes to another horrible situation, way worse than Oakland. He goes to the Browns. I mean, he'll be lucky if we hire him back as offensive coordinator in a couple of years. <laughs> Yeah, if any team knows what it's like to dump coaches, it's that team. Exactly, John, that's right. You know, some people are replaceable, and I think Hugh is definitely one of those guys, but some are not as easily replaced, and that's the topic of today's Hojascope. John, you might not know the history of, sorry if I spit when I speak, but it all started with a guy and a dream, Daddy o McDuck, who founded this show. He has since disappeared, and we don't know where he is, although strangely, he still produces the show. We film the show on tapes, 8mm tapes, and we drop them off at an abandoned Jack in the box drive through window somehow the show gets made don't ask me how anyways over the years after that you left we've had a number of hosts try to take his place it's like uh, Siskel and Ebert if you remember one of the two died and they kept trying to find replacements until uh, Al Roper from Three's Company came along anyways we had Carl Schenk who rose to the top by being a daddy of fanboy and a Cincy jungle yes man then we had this slovenly used tire salesman <laughs> Then we had Brian Filipiak, smart guy, really knows his X's and O's, but when I explained my Steelers UFO cult theory to him, he stopped returning my calls. You know, that's okay. Then we had this mustard for brains guy from Atlantic City who didn't even know what the fourth down was. And now, John, we have you. You're the best of the replacements, in my opinion. But, but you know, taking Daddy's place is a really big task. Well, considering I have no idea who any of those guys are, I have to say I'm quite honored, Haji. My prediction is that John and I will begin with a sense of mutual respect, go through a period of mistrust and second thoughts, but come through in the end as best friends. The chemistry will be so contagious that the ESPN network will sign our show for nightly broadcast and, oh yeah, the Bengals will win the Super Bowl. So, boys and girls, that's the end of our show. Okay, wait. Uh, this is going to sound desperate, but our producers are telling me to ask you to like us. Please, please, please like us, please. I know you sometimes dislike the things we say. Like us on Facebook. We have a page now and liking that page means they follow right. us, Haji. Four people have already liked the page and one of them doesn't even work for the show. So that's it. We'll see you next time. See you.